Hi. I thought what I'd give you today is a, uh, a reading from a story of mine, actually a novelette that was published in this anthology. Old Venus, which was uh, edited by George Martin and uh, Gardner Dozois. This is a 2015 anthology. Um, George and Gardner had done an earlier anthology called Old Mars um, and had invited me to write a story for this one, which was to be entitled Old Venus. The themes of both of those anthologies was to pretend that it was the 1940s, 1950s, even into the early 60s when we thought Venus and Mars held life, uh, when we thought that we could explore these worlds and it would be like exploring a brand new Earth with uh, different creatures on it, uh, with different life forms on it, possibly even with, with sentient species there. Um, we found out in the 60s that uh, it, with the space program, that wasn't going to be the case. Uh, the Mariner spacecraft went by Venus in 1962, um, and it's, it's recording of... Uh, the planet, uh, the data from that plant from Mariner was that uh, no, no, this this was a this was a really 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 hot world of 800 plus degrees Fahrenheit, and that uh, the clouds that blanketed Venus and hid the surface from us for so long uh, weren't water vapor clouds, and it wasn't constantly raining on Venus. No, that was sulfuric acid cloud, and uh, Venus was just terrifically hot and not hospitable to any life form at all. Um, and so we realized that all those stories, stories written in the 40s and 50s weren't ever going to be true. Um, but Gardner and George thought, let's pretend let's let's do stories of set on the on the these worlds that we once thought existed and uh, so I wrote uh, this novelette called bones of air bones of stone uh, set on Venus of maybe the 1940s we don't know so here it is take a small rock Toss it into a rotating cylinder and pour in abrasives. Tumble the mess for several days while the grit gnaws at the hard edges and scrubs the rounding surfaces. What eventually emerges from the harsh chrysalis of the tumbler is rock subdued and transformed, shimmering and polished like molten glass, all the hidden colors and veins revealed. Somewhere in my early teens, my parents gave me a rock polishing kit. I went pretty quickly through the provided assortment of pebbles, pleased with what came from my growling, slow cylinder, but bored with the tedious long hours needed for the result. Like most kids that age, I preferred instant gratification. I would almost certainly have set the polishing kit aside, like every other hobby of the month I'd owned, except that my grandmother, Avaco, came up to my room one evening not long after. Here, Tomio, she said, handing me a drab, ordinary piece of dark, dark rock. Run this through your noisy machine for me. Sure, I said. We were all used to the brusque, brusque demands of the Norcon shuttle's matriarch, just as she was used to obedience. I tossed the rock up and down in my hand. It was nothing I'd have chosen, a chunk of undistinguished granite. Why don't you get some opal from the gardener, Obasan, I suggested, not wanting her to be disappointed with what I was certain would be mediocre results. It'd look a lot better. She sniffed, taking the rock back from me and holding it in her fingers. I remember that her fingers were thin and wrinkled already, with knuckles swollen and large with arthritis that would only worsen as the years went on. Obviously, you don't know what this is, she told me. It's granite, I told her. It's about as common as dirt. She shook her head at me. This is a Kiko. My Obasan. I could feel my brow wrinkling. I, d I don't understand, Obasan. So I see. Obasan Avako sighed and sat on my bed, twirling the rock in the afternoon sun coming through the window. A Kiko had a wonderful garden in our villa in Chincha Alta. 
I grew up there, and that's where I always came back to visit her. On my last visit, just before she died, I took the stone from the garden. It's not an important stone, not any different from a thousand others there. Yet, every time I look at it, I can see Akiko again in that garden. As long as this rock lasts, so will that image in my mind. She'd been speaking more to the sunlight and the rock than to me. Now she turned and fixed her gaze on me, as sharp as the flaked edges of the rock. How can this rock be less than beautiful with the truth and memories it holds? She didn't say anything else, just placed a pebble on the cover of the bed and left the room, knowing I'd do what she asked. And, of course, I did. It took several days to give the rock the right sheen to take all the edges from it. When I finally took it from the tumbler, a pointillistic swirl of colors rolled in the palm of my hand, and I found myself turning it over and over, marveling at the complex play of hue and shade. Obasan Avako, when I gave it to her, nearly smiled. Now it looks more like her than ever, she said. I can see the true beauty of her that was hidden in the stone. Ever since then, for many years... I would take common pebbles from places that were important to me at the time and try to uncover whatever gift they held. Many times the results were disappointing, an utter waste of time, but a few of them I've kept with me wherever I've gone. A pale pink crystal shot with fractures that comes from the garden of the Norcon estate on Cape Hinamoski near Izumo, a piece of home that pulls the Nippon and especially the Shemain prefecture from its resting place in my mind. A thick needle of dark gray granite from the hills of New Hampshire where I went to university, the subtle rich satin of its surface never failing to conjure autumn on the east coast of North America. A nearly round ball packed with fine, crazed white lines from Tycho Crater on the moon. My first trip off world. The quick panic of stepping outside unprotected from vacuum except by my spacesuit. The euphora of bounding in one quarter gravity across dusty plains. A red orange marble with streaks of rich brown. I plucked that from Olympus Mons on Mars during my ascent with Avariel. I thought then that I'd met the one true love of my life with her. An ebony glass spheroid speckled with blue-black highlights at the beach at Blackstone Bay. That stone was also a Vareal. That stone was Venus. I'd not expected to be back on Venus ever again. I thought that all I would ever retain of Venus and a Vareal was that fragment of polished lava. The single precipitous main street of Port Blackstone was raucous and loud and more crowded than I remembered. There were even a few Shriliala on the streets too, something that when I was last there, a decade and a half ago, wasn't common. Back then, if you saw Shriliala, the sentient Venusian race who lived under the waves of the always sea, the endless and shallow ocean that covers their world, it was either down at undersea port where if you were out on the always sea. I could smell their cinnamon-laden exhalations as I passed them, sucking in seawater from the bubblers strapped between the double line of fins down their backs. The buildings I passed on the way, clinging like limpets to the steep side of the volcanic island that was the single landmass on Venus, seemed weary and exhausted. The fresh paint that had been smeared on them seemed like the too thick makeup on an ancient whore, enhancing rather than hiding age. The smell was the same, though. The wind that smeared the low ranks of clouds over Port Blackstone smelled of the always sea, an odor of sulfurous brine, a stench of rotting vegetation, the cinnamon of the Shriliala. The air was as thick as I remembered it being, heavily oxygenated and laden with moisture. There was no sun. There was never a sun during Venus's day, only the smeared, unfocused light that the clouds allowed through. And the rain. If the Eskimos have a hundred words for snow, the humans who live on Venus have nearly as many words for the types of rain that the eternal clouds spew down on them. It was raining now, as it usually did, what the locals called a sheeter, 
a needle-like wind-driven s uh, spray that was part rain and part foam ripped from the ocean waves. The sheeter hissed and fumed against my rain shield as it pummeled the buildings on either side of me. Lightning shimmered blue-white right, blue -right through the clouds overhead, sending brace sending brief racing shadows across the street. The thunder followed a half second later, crackling and loud enough to rattle the windows on the nearest buildings. I walked down Blackstone's lone, rain-slick street from the flat plateau where the supply shuttles landed on the shoulder of the volcano toward the pro port proper, my luggage rolling along behind me on its auto cart. At the far end of the street, amongst the piers and jetties and the eternal wave spray, the street finally plunged under the long racing swells, undersea port, where the human world met that of the Sri Liala. Maybe it was the grit, relentless and grim dimness of the day. Maybe it was my expectations. Maybe it was the oppressive heat. Have I mentioned the heat yet? But Venus and Blackstone seemed less than enthusiastic in welcoming me back, welcoming me back from Earth after over a decade. A group of youths, dressed in thin labor, laborers' clothing, ran by me in the rain, shouting half-heard words in their thick Venusian accents that might have been curses. Shopkeepers leaned in the doorways of their businesses, staring at me like the intruder I was. I knew why they stared. It's not often that you see a person with field prostheses, especially not in an age where limbs can usually, usually, such a comforting word unless it doesn't apply to you, can be regrown. The emptiness between my hips and shoes were twin-shaped fields, the controls implanted along my spine. The shoes, at the far end of the field, moved as if attached to bone, sinew, and flesh, which showed my years of practice. In the correct light, you can see the heat waver of the fields. An imaginative person can, can sense the flexing and almost glints the transparent legs. Almost. I could wear long trousers and have it appear that my body's whole, albeit somewhat stiff. But why play that charade? Obasan Avako always scolded us for telling unvoiced lies, for pretending to be something we weren't. Besides, no one wears much clothing on Venus. It's too damned hot and too damned wet for that. So instead, I wore shorts which just covered the stumps of my thighs, which means that I looked like the torso of a dismembered body floating ghost-like a meter above the ground. I wondered how many of those here would think back 15 years and remember my face from the newscasts of the time. Probably none of them looked at my face at all. 15 years ago, I left my legs behind on Venus. I'd left behind a lot more as well. I ran fingertips over the cool, smooth surface of the stones in my pocket, and when I found a familiar shape, I pulled it out. The stone, polished and about as big as the tip of my little finger, was satin black and glossy. Flecked with a blue that was almost black itself, I turned it on my fingers, looking at all the familiar swirls of its polished surface, then shoved it back in my pocket. I stayed in my hotel long enough to unpack a few things, then hobbled out toward the lone Blackstone Tavern, fumbling with anxious fingers at the five or six polished stones in my pocket. Fifteen years ago, the establishment had been called By the Sea, and Avario and I had eaten and gotten drunk there a few times before we left the port. The sign outside the establishment proclaimed that it was now Venus Genetrix, Mother Venus. I doubted that anyone here either knew or cared. I was just glad to leave this wet, steep streets and the suspicious stairs for the bar. Fuck, look at that, someone said as I entered, in an inebriated stage whisper. Half the patrons of the, of the tavern glanced around at me with that, and in the blur of faces, I saw her. In an alcove to the back, she sat in dim light. Seeing Avario reminded me of too many things. I wanted to hide. I wanted to run. Running was one thing I'm no longer capable of. A fast walk's the best I can manage. Instead, I smiled, rattled the stones in my pocket, and walked toward their alcove. Next to her was a Sri Liala, the tubes of a bubbler wrapped around its purple and green neck over the gill slits. Its long webbed fingers lifted as if it were in mid-speech with Avario. 
though its mouth was closed, and it too was looking my way. Its huge eyes blinked once, the transparent underlid sliding sideways, the translucent overlid sliding up from under the, from their pouch under the eyes. The Sri Liala had the slash of an overseer tattooed on the lilac scales of the crown of its head. Beneath it was the emerald dot that said it was a member of the council. There was another mark, too, a short yellow-white bar bulging slightly at either end. This Sri Liala possessed bones of air, a mutation that caused some Sri Liala to have lightweight, air-pocketed bones, which meant it could never sink into the great darkness to rest with its own kind, the normal Sri Liala with what they call bones of stone. Instead, this Sri Liala would be burned here on the island when it died, in the caldera at the summit of Blackstone, the place the Sri Liala called the Pit. Avaria watched my approach with a careful, almost smile on her face. The Venusian watched as well, but I knew that attempting to read any human emotion into that face would be a mistake. Avaria, I said when I reached the table, I thought I might find you here. She looked older. Somehow, I hadn't expected that. There were severe lines around her eyes and at the corners of her mouth that hadn't been there before, and creases around her neck. Gray had settled in the dark brown hair of her temples. Her, her arms were covered with white patches of scars, some of them new. But she was still muscular and fit, still the athlete, ready to conquer any physical task to which she set herself. Her smile flickered, settled. Tomio, she answered flatly. The Sri Liala's huge eyes swiveled in their sockets as it looked from her to me. Bubbles thrashed their way through the clear plastic pipes connecting its gill bubbler to the tank on its back. I have to admit, I didn't expect to see you here. Really, I answered, returning her meaningless smile. After the Green Council's decision, I thought you'd expect me to come here, if only because I knew you'd be the first one here. Tomio. A sigh. Her fingers tapped an aimless rhythm on the tabletop near her ale. There's no going back to what we were. I'm sorry. You really shouldn't have come here. I raised my hand. Uh-uh, I said. Our relationship isn't at issue. You know, despite everything, I would have come if you'd asked, if you'd stayed in touch after... I gestured to the empty space between the stumps of my legs and the floor. Don't lay that guilt at my door, Tomio. I won't accept it. The Sri Liala seemed to hiss, spraying a fine mist of water from its mouth. It adjusted the bubbler. The salty droplets pooled on the varnish of the table. We all looked at it. The humans know one another? The humans know one another? It had been a long time since I heard the Sri Liala accent. I had to replay the comment in my head before I understood what it had said, by which time Avario had already answered. Tomio was here with me the last time, Asalalo. We went down to the great darkness together. The Sri Liala nodded, the last time. The water going from green to blue to black. I thought it would be easy. I thought we'd just swim down and down until we reached the bottom. Avariel's comment was all that was needed. Asalalo seemed to know immediately what she referred to. Even if the, for the short-lived Sri Lalala, the events of 15 Earth years ago were a generation removed. Asalalo, who looked to be in his prime years, probably hadn't been alive then, or was just a newly sprouted bud. Will it... Asalalo stumbled over the pronoun and spat water again. I mean, he be going with you this time? No, Avario answered. Her gaze was on me and the smile had seemingly vanished. He won't. In fact, he shouldn't be here now. She started to get up. I reached out and found her arm. Avario, I'm sorry. Really. Please don't go. In the dim light, her eyes were bright with reflections. The great darkness took my legs, I said. I think that's all the motivation I need. Avariel, you knew you were coming back as soon as the Green Council would allow it, but you weren't sure that I would. I wasn't the one who left the relationship as soon as possible after I was hurt. I saw a trail of moisture on her face, and I suddenly hated myself. I'm sorry, I said. That was unfair. No, she answered very softly. 
I don't think that was unfair at all. Then we could still do this together. Optimism rose like a bird. No. And plummeted stricken back to earth. But I understand why you had to ask. Neither of us said anything for long as seconds after that. Avariel sighed and reached down below her chair, pulling up a backpack. She put the straps around her shoulder and cinched the left side tightly, muscles nodding along her jaw. Getting to the bottom of the great darkness was the only time I failed at something I tried, she answered finally. That's why I'm here. Avariel adjusted the other strap and got to her feet, hefting the pack. People sometimes need something so badly they'd sacrifice anything to attain it, she said. I wouldn't want it to be any other way, not for me. I thought it was you, I wanted to tell her. I thought it was you that I needed like that. Now, I, I don't know. And, if I, and I thought if I saw you again, I might find out. I understand, was all I said. I hope you do, she said, slinging the pack over her shoulder. Then her voice and her face softened. I never wanted to hurt you, Tomio. I hope you can believe that, at least. I'm sorry I wasn't the type of person who could share her life with you, and maybe that was more my fault than yours. I shrugged back at her. If you had been that person, I probably wouldn't have wanted you so much, I told her. She lifted her chin with that. Then her glaze, her gaze slid over to Hasalalo. Make the arrangements, Hasalalo, she told the Venusian. I'll come back tomorrow with the final part of the feat, and we'll do this. Yes, Avariel. Yes. With a hiss and a lisp, the liquid affirmation came wafting over the table, laden with the odor of cinnamon. Avariel nodded once before turning and leaving. And that's as far as I'll go. Uh, the rest of the story is in the anthology. Look it up. It's still available.